thanks. Can you hear me well? Sound okay? okay? What on earth do buildings have to do with consciousness? And how do they really fit into the theme of hacking consciousness? It turns out that buildings, George? Hi, good to see you. A friend from fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> It's lovely to see you here. <laughs> what does architecture have to do with consciousness? It turns out quite a bit because we spend 90 or perhaps in California where we spend so much time in cars, 80% of our time in buildings. And buildings have a pretty dramatic effect upon the flow of consciousness and our ability to, to use it, to bring it to bear in our activities. And I'm going to look at two aspects of that. And I'm going to make the case for why my assertion is true and then what we can do about it, what the technology is that allows us to use the influence of buildings on us for our own good. I'm, of course, I'm going to be speaking from the Vedic perspective because that is something which has illuminated my own spiritual journey and my practice of architecture for my entire adult life. And I'm going to first give you a few terms, and then I'll just speak without reference to slides for a while. So first of all, as I think you have probably already reviewed multiple times, the word Ved, which is a Sanskrit word, is commonly translated as meaning knowledge. but I am in the lineage, one particular lineage, which has been represented in recent decades by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and his preferred definition or translation of the word Ved is total knowledge. And what he means by that is that it is the compactified intelligence at the basis of reality. And one of its aspects, because it has different aspects, is the aspect of establishing the structures of nature. And the word stapan is a Sanskrit word that means to establish. And so one of the aspects of Ved and Vedic literature is the establishing quality or stapatya Ved, which we could say then literally translates as the total knowledge of establishing, but what the heck does that phrase mean? And uh, a much more understandable phrase is the architecture of nature or natural law-based architecture. And there's a synonym also from sans the Sanskrit, which is the word vastu. And literally, though it has multiple meanings, the pertinent re meaning is that in any structure in the natural universe, there are some laws of nature that maintain the balance between the parts and the whole of it. And whatever those laws of nature are, in Sanskrit, we refer to by the word vastu. And so if we can build a building, a house, that also maintains balance between the parts and the whole, and by the whole, I'm also referring to the unified field of consciousness at the basis of life, that would be very valuable. And we would say then that the quality of vastu is lively in that building. So we commonly, in India, refer to such buildings as, as vastu buildings. And of course, I've already mentioned the, the particular lineage that I'm representing. Um, when Maharishi examined the system of Vastu as it has survived for thousands of years in India, he didn't find any single tradition, any single family lineage of architects who seemed to have all of the information. And so he worked with the different families and with the Vedic texts for many years to reconstruct it so it would be fully effective. And so what I practice is therefore we associate with his name, so we refer to it as Maharishi Vastu architecture. So that's it for the slides for a while. I said that there are two ways in which buildings potentially have important effects upon us and upon our consciousness. And the first, I'm going to build a case for it. Uh, initially. We exist within a whole nest of structures in nature. We exist within a galaxy. 
Within that, we exist within a solar system. Then we exist on a planet. And then the next level of structure of nature is our own physiology. And within it, there's another level of structures of according to nature, which are the cells in our body. With them, within them, there are the molecules, including DNA. And within them, there are atoms. All of these are structures according to natural law. The entire universe is nested structures, all organized according to natural law. And, and when we experience the universe, our experience of these structures is one of continuity and one of balance. Even though quantum physics tells us that the reality is that all of these structures that we perceive and experience and inhabit and that inhabit us are composed of elementary particles which have lifespans of a billionth of a second and then are replaced by others that arise out of the unified field. And so there are some laws of nature that create for us this experience of continuity when the reality is anything but that. Particles dissolving billions of times per second being replaced by others. But then there are a few other structures in nature that are not structured according to natural law. See, all of the structures that I described to you are all direct reflections of the organizing intelligence at the basis of nature. John Hagelin talked to you, I assume, about the parallels, the precise parallels, the precise ways in which the discoveries of quantum physics map over Vedic knowledge that the ancient perspective of consciousness as the basis of all of reality precisely maps over quantum physics understanding of the nature of reality, one-to-one -one correspondence, as there should be. And so it's within this context that all structures are reflections of that underlying intelligence. All structures, that is, except for those structures that we then spend 90% of our lives within. I'm talking about buildings and cities and, for that matter, cars. We spend maybe 99% of our lives in these humanly made structures. Now, I'm an architect. I went to a very fine school. I was there for eight years. And I didn't learn anything about nature's architecture in that school during that time because Architecture, unlike any field of engineering, is not based in natural law. What do I mean by that? Well, are you worried that the ceiling above you is going to collapse on your head? No. Maybe now that I mentioned it, but you were not <laughs> worrying about it. And that's because we're quite confident that the trusses above that ceiling were designed by structural engineers. And we're quite confident that structural engineers' work is successful 100% of the time. Why is that? Because they are simply using laws of nature. Physicists, starting with Einstein, uh, starting with Newton, mapped out how gravity works. And, and gradually, material scientists were able to analyze the strength of materials and the relationship between the failure of materials and the force of gravity. And ultimately, structural engineers using these laws of nature are able to design beams and know exactly how much weight they're going to support. And just so that you feel comfortable, there's always a, a safety factor of about 100% in anything that's actually built. So similarly, when this room was opened up to us about a half an hour ago, someone flipped a switch and the lights came on. And that person was not surprised, did not say, oh, good, today the lights came on. Why? Because the electrical system was designed by an electrical engineer who was applying laws of nature in laying out that system to do with, obviously, electricity and material science. And, 
And so the point that I'm making is that all of the fields of engineering, and there are many, are applications of laws of nature. And when and a law of nature is universal, it is consistent, it is true whether we are familiar with it or not. And if we're familiar with it, it's true whether we believe it or not. OK? And so you can deny the reality of structural engineering, but that doesn't make the ceiling collapse on your head. Now, the f several fields of engineering are very closely associated with architecture. They are necessary components of it. And so I always work with structural engineers and electrical engineers on the buildings I design. And I know that those things are going to work perfectly. But the architecture itself is another matter. What is the actual core of architecture? And let me stop and ask for a minute, are there any architecture students or architects in the room? How many of you are in the class and how many of you are just visiting to hear the lecture? Uh, in the class. OK. All right. The reality of architecture is it's about enclosing space. Space is everywhere, everywhere in the universe. What an architect does at her or his essence is enclose a bit of space by putting up walls, a floor, and a ceiling. So this room became a room by virtue of the enclosure, but the space which is actually this room, was always here. But was it usable for this purpose, for a lecture, before it was enclosed? No, of course not. So the real essence, the purpose of architecture, is to enclose space for a purpose. And that purpose might be to live one's life in, in a house. It might be to learn things in a classroom. It might be to recuperate in a hospital room. And so the true way to measure the success of an architect's work is by asking how successful are the functions of those bits of space that that architect has enclosed over the course of her or his career. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty obvious. And you know, it's it, it, as a parallel to any field of engineering, we measure the success of an engineer by, if it's the structural engineer, whether their roofs collapse, and they never collapse. Maybe one in a million eventually collapses within, within 100 years. And so engineers' success rate is generally about 100%. What is the success rate of architects? It varies widely, hugely. Every architect, I'll let you in on a secret, in school studies examples of buildings that are widely accepted as being very successful and other buildings that are universally condemned are understood to have been complete failures. For instance, there was an apartment complex built in St. Louis in the early 1950s. Every architect studies that apartment complex. It was why? Because it was torn down 17 years after it was built, because the quality of life in it was so poor. So we study the good ones, buildings that have been lauded for generations for the spiritual quality of experience inside them, for example, great ecclesiastic spaces, for instance, Chartres Cathedral as an example. And we study the failures. And the hope is that through the study of the good and the bad, that young architecture student in their own career is going to design buildings that are more like the successes and less like the failures. Through some process of osmosis, they're going to absorb the laws of nature that cause buildings to have different kinds of effects. Well, can you imagine if a structural engineer was educated in that way by looking at beams that succeeded and looking at beams that failed and then being told now in your career, I want your beams to succeed. That would be intolerable. 
And it would be pretty unpleasant for those of us who occupy their buildings because they might collapse it at any moment. Maybe not here where there's no snow, but where I live and there is snow, every winter buildings would collapse and that would be very unpleasant for us. So the difference is that while architects know very clearly, and, and, and many lay people know, that buildings have different kinds of effects upon quality of life, we don't know what the rules are. Buildings have effects upon consciousness. We, many of us in our travels have had experiences in, in buildings that we visited, maybe famous buildings, maybe spiritual buildings. We felt something very different inside and we have felt very unpleasant experiences perhaps sometime or another in certain other buildings we can think of. And so it's a very dramatic and real thing, but we don't know what the rules are. Every architect knows it has something to do with sunlight and how sunlight enters and is experienced in a building. Every architect knows it has something to do with the floor plan, with, in other words, what is where in the building. It has something to do with proportions and measurements of the building. It surely has something to do with the materials of which the building is made. And finally, it clearly has something to do with the site, with the location where a building is built. But we don't know what the rules are. And yet there are rules. I'm going to make up a hypothetical now to drive that home. Let's say that in the course of your life, you, some of you are uh, biology majors because this course is partly being offered through the biology department. So maybe some of you someday will be affiliated with a hospital and someday you might be on the board of trustees of the hospital and you may be on the building committee and it seems to be the nature of hospitals to expand and every few years they build another wing. And so you might be on the committee for expansion of the hospital for a couple of years and that means that you're going to at some point in time probably interview three different architectural firms to pick one, they all specialize in hospital buildings, to pick one to design the new wing of your hospital. Wouldn't it be logical, wouldn't it be efficient in those interviews for you to ask the architects, okay, you specialize in hospital designs, will you give me the statistics for the recovery rates of the patients who have been admitted to the hospitals that you've designed? That would be very sensible, and yet it's almost laughable. It's such a kind of startling proposition to make. And I can assure you that if any architect were asked that question, they would stammer and say they have no idea. They don't keep the results. And why is that? Because we don't actually think that we can reliably control the outcomes. Because we don't know what the rules are, unlike any engineer. We don't know what the rules are for creating different influences in spaces. And yet, if an architect who specializes in hospitals was serious about it and they spent some time going through PubMed, which is the international database of medical studies that have been published, they might run across a study that was published 20 years ago in a medical journal in, in Europe that we found. And it was very interesting. Let me tell you about this study. It looked at one ward of a hospital. What is a ward of a hospital? It's a corridor with identical patient rooms on both sides, right? Pretty simple thing. This particular ward, the corridor ran north-south. Just a coincidence, happened to. All of the patients admitted to this ward had one of two conditions. The researchers examined the historical records of the patients who had been treated in this ward. And they found something very unexpected, which is that for one of the two conditions, half of the patients who were admitted got released from treatment three and a half days faster than another half of the patients. Three and a half days. Can you imagine, so there, there was something, something that caused half of the patients to get released from treatment to be cured three and a half days sooner than the others. Can you imagine if we knew what that was, all the pain and suffering in the world that could be reduced and perhaps billions of dollars in healthcare expenses that could be reduced? Well, what was the difference? Has anybody figured out 
from a clue or two that I've given what it might have been, what the difference might have been between these two populations of the patients? Some, you're nodding your head. Do you want in white? Will you tell me? Yeah, I would just guess that the people on the south side of the building heal faster because there's more sunlight available to them in the you're, 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 um, you're thinking about the right things. The corridor runs north-south, though, from north to south. The rooms are east-west. How about you and green? East. Yeah. It was, it was the patients who were randomly assigned, checked into rooms on the east side of the corridor who were released from treatment three and a half days sooner than the patients who were randomly checked into rooms on the west side of the corridor. Wow. <laughs> now, why did I tell you about that study? Did you want to say something? It's three and a half days, but what was the average time? I don't know, and I'm going to get the actual, it doesn't, didn't say in the abstract. And I just tracked down the original study, and I was just corresponding with my assistant today, and we're going to get the full study, and I'm going to find out. It was uh, bipolar disorder, and I think typically treatments for that are fairly short, so, but I don't know exactly. And one needs to know, because if it was three and a half days out of a week, that's hugely significant. If it's three and a half days out of two months, well, it's pretty good, but it's not as, as significant. So I want to find out, and I will before I give this talk next. But this finding did not surprise those of us who are familiar with the Vedic literature, because in the texts of Stapachaved or Vastu, is the following information, and now we get into hacking consciousness pertinent to buildings, that there's an influence that comes from the East on planet Earth, which is nourishing, which is good for our health. And because we don't inhabit the surface of the Earth, but we actually inhabit intermediaries between us and the Earth, these buildings, it's ideal for a building to have plenty of east windows, east openings, to let that influence from the east penetrate deeply into the building. And so that is probably what was being documented in that study. I'd like to see a few more studies done that can really tie it down, but that's very suggestive to us and gives us a little bit of reassurance about this ancient system. So let's move on to another subject that's very closely related to it. If it is possible for buildings to have different kinds of effects, and if it is really not a matter of a placebo or superstition, but it's, it's laws of nature that are causing these effects, then a question to ask is, well, what's the most powerful influence of natural law on the surface of this earth? And I would say the answer to that question is the sun. It rises in the east, it passes overhead, it sets in the west, and we all experience the different qualities of the sun's energy every day. If we happen to get up early one morning and we're out when the sun is rising, that's very nourishing. And it's a really good start for the day. We feel the difference many times all day long. Midday sun is very intense. The setting sun is an influence of decline. Now, the Vedic literature actually has a record of, from this paradigm, each of the different qualities of the sun's energy over the course of the 24-hour diurnal cycle. And there are 12. Every two-hour period of the sun's passage around the Earth or the Earth's passage rotating on its axis are associated with a different quality of the sun's energy. And we use them. Now, that would be useful if, if this is true, if this paradigm that I'm starting to construct is, is a real paradigm, then it might be that, for instance, the direction in which we face makes a difference. If we face east, there might be some different effect than if we face west. And actually, all of us at this moment and at every moment are on a vehicle. And that vehicle is moving at, I think, 24,000 miles an hour. Somebody in this room may know exactly. And that vehicle that I'm talking about is the surface of the Earth because it's spinning. It's rotating on its axis. And its direction of travel is from west to east. Um, 
I actually like to always know when I'm talking what direction I'm facing. Does anybody know? West. I'm facing west. I'm opening my compass. Ideally, I always face east because, as I'll explain to you, brain coherence is greatest, is maximized when you're facing east. Now we're getting into hacking consciousness. Well, this says I'm facing north. That's OK. No. <laughs> it's not working. It got stymied by being deep in this building. OK, I don't know, but I'll assume that I'm facing west. So I'm building up a case. I'm making a claim that the direction that we face makes a difference. And if this is true, you would expect that life would have evolved such that there'd be some part of, of us that is sensitive to orientation, that is monitoring what direction we're facing. And there is. And it's a very, very important part of our physiology. From some perspectives, the most important part of our physiology. And it's the thalamus. It's where my fingers intersect, at the very center of the skull. The cerebral cortex sits on top of it, the cerebellum behind it. It is the head of the limbic system, which includes the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the thyroid. And extending down from it is the spinal column. And it is composed of neurons. And communication between the brain and the rest of the physiology passes through the thalamus. The neurons of the thalamus are the gatekeepers between mind and body. It turns out that many, many hundreds of thousands of those neurons in the thalamus are direction sensitive and actually transmit their information at different rates when we face different directions. So the thing which is the link between mind and body, and which controls the limbic system, which is responsible for all flows and changes, chemical secretions in the body, spectacularly important, and which is also responsible for the self. The fact that there is a self in a human physiology is a product of the thalamus. If the thalamus stops working, we don't know who we are. We've lost the self. It's the, this core aspect of our physiology. And it functions differently when we face different directions. Very, very interesting. So something's going on on planet Earth that caused life to evolve this way. So if this is true, if orientation makes a difference, here's a question for you. What's the single thing that we do within every 24-hour day in which we spend the greatest amount of time facing a single direction, oriented one way. Sleeping. Sleeping. Ideally, that's a third of the day. Maybe for some of you students, it's a little less. It certainly was for me in architecture school, and that did my display of consciousness no good. And so it would not surprise you then that the Vedic literature has opinions about what direction to sleep. OK? You can, you can try this out at home. And it's real easy. You don't even have to write it down. This way is east, we think. That's good. All of you are facing east. That's the best direction to sleep. What do I mean by that? I mean pillow end of the bed to the east. OK? Now I'm going to rotate clockwise 90 degrees at a time. And I'm going to go from best to worst. So very easy to remember. I'm facing east, I think. That's best. I'm facing south. That's good. But it's actually particularly good if you're recuperating from illness. I'm facing west. Not good. I'm facing north. That's the worst. OK? And as I said, you can try this at home. And people commonly report to me that upon rotating their bed or putting the pillow at the other end, 
according to this ancient information, which every Indian family knows. You know, mother or grandmother told you, always sleep, never sleep with the feet to the south, always sleep with the head to the east. And, you know, was it, is it a superstition in, in your family or is it real? Well, so here's the research. A neurophysiology at a university, a neurophysiologist was curious about this. And so he put lab animals in very narrow cages at bedtime. And then he oriented half the cages so that half the animals were sleeping with their heads to the east and half with their heads to the north, the best and the worst. In the morning, he took blood samples from them. And he assayed them for levels of stress hormones. What's a stress hormone? It's secreted by the limbic system, which is controlled by the thalamus. And stress hormones direct the organs of the body to work harder. If an organ of the body is made to work harder for a long period of time, what's going to happen to it? It's going to fail sooner. It's not a good thing. But if we're under stress, then it's useful. The organs need to work harder in order to maintain homeostasis. Okay? So what did he find out in, in assaying the blood of those animals? Those animals who were made to sleep with their heads to the east in the morning had reduced levels of stress hormones in their bloodstream. Those animals who were made to sleep with their heads to the north had elevated levels of stress hormones in their bloodstream. He then put them back in a cage and had a research assistant watch them interact during the day. And they reported that the animals who had been made to sleep with their heads to the east were peaceful, and those who were made to sleep with their heads to the north fought with each other. Now, this was a pilot study. It hasn't been published. And I would like to see someone follow up, do a large sample, and publish it. But the preliminary results are very tantalizing. So a physician heard about this, and she was curious, and she did a survey of her patients. And she analyzed the results and published it in a good peer-reviewed medical journal. And the results were that among her patients, who are unfamiliar with Vedic technologies, those who happen to sleep with their heads to the north have the worst mental health, have the most depression and anxiety. So I do recommend to you, as a take home from this course in Hacking Consciousness, that you seriously consider sleeping with your heads to the east or to the south. By the way, if the building that you occupy is not on the grid, does not face one of the cardinal directions, and by that I'm talking about true solar directions, not magnetic, which is off quite a bit in Palo Alto. Um, If you do this, people report to me commonly, having switched their bed around, that they are sleeping better now. And frequently, that they feel more rested and more alert during the day. So I always make a mess of hotel rooms when I stay in a hotel. I always make sure, before I book a hotel, what direction the hotel faces for reasons that I will described you in a minute, and Google Earth makes that very easy to find out. But I don't have control ahead of time over the direction the bed faces. Now, OK, so that's interesting. So one, one aspect of Vedic or Vastu architecture is that we design houses so that it will make sense for the beds to have the headboard to the east or to the south. And there are other things that we do that are important parts of our days that we also have information about what direction they should face, according to this ancient tradition, this ancient paradigm. The ideal directions to face for primary activities when we're awake is to the east or to the north. Okay, Different than sleeping. But we all know that being awake is different than sleeping. Now, the next thing that we do in Vastu or Vedic houses is that we bring plenty of east light into them. And we've already talked about one study that maybe gives us some insight into why that's a nourishing thing, why that's a good thing. In fact, we will commonly elongate buildings so that the long sides are the east and west sides. But that has another effect, which is a good effect, and that I will talk about next. 
the strongest effect of the sun on us when we're in that intermediary, a building, is the most improbable. It's really surprising to most Americans, though it is not at all surprising to people from quite a few other cultures, including several Native American tribes. And that is that the direction that the building faces is the single biggest factor about a building that affects consciousness, that affects the quality of our lives in the building. Now, different traditions have different opinions about what's the best and what's the worst. The Vedic tradition says emphatically that east is the best direction for a house to face, that it creates influences of success and coherence and enlightenment, and that south is the worst direction for a house to face. Now, in uh, many feng shui traditions associated with East Asia, south is considered good. And I can, if you're interested and we have time for some questions and, and you want to ask me, I've done quite a bit of probing and spoke, spoken to feng shui masters and, and I have, I have some, some insights into that. But the Vedic perspective, which is the one that I represent, says east is best, south is worst. So what's the data say? There have been four studies to date. Three of these four have been published in peer-reviewed medical journals, but the fourth was a pretty large sample and it was done by a physician very carefully and so I think it's probably quite credible. He's trying to do a sample of 1,000 now so they can submit it for publication. Here are the results. These are all, first of all, we haven't done any research on people inhabiting Vastu homes. Why, any ideas? The placebo effect. If you're living in one, you know you're living in it, and you know what the benefits are supposed to be, and that may bias your experience. And so you don't do good research by measuring effects upon people who know what the outcome is supposed to be. So the research that's been done to date has been on randomly selected non-Vastu homes, and then comparing the orientation of those homes to some objective measurement of quality of life that can be obtained for the occupants of those buildings. And the results to date are that mental health correlates with house orientation. South-facing houses, the people who live in them have the highest incidence of depression and anxiety. The second is heart condition. The likelihood that you're under the care of a cardiologist is strongly correlated with the direction that your house faces. And again, the highest percentage is in south-facing houses. The third is prosperity. When people randomly selected fill out a survey that documents their prosperity, again, it correlates with house orientation, again with South scoring the worst. And finally, and this is the most improbable, and yet it was very statistically significant and it was, it was accepted for publication in a, good, in a good journal, burglary rates strongly, strongly correlate with the direction that houses face, even in cities that are on the grid where there are an equal number of houses that face all four directions. So we, I think we have to take this seriously that it is verifiable, at least from you know, some initial studies that are consistent enough to make us want to take this body of knowledge seriously, that the direction that a house faces has an effect upon the quality of our life. And in hacking consciousness, one thing that we want to add to the list of take homes from this course is pay attention to what direction my home my dorm, my office building faces. East and north are the best. Simple as that. But there are more factors. The next is also because of the influence of the sun. I described the different qualities of the sun's energy over the course of the day. we should make use of those different qualities of the sun's energy by putting different functions in different locations in the house according to these qualities of energy. For instance, 
We may as well dine where digestion is best. We may as well put our living room where conviviality is greatest. If we meditate, and obviously more people in this room meditate than in the average classroom, we should do it in the part of the house that promotes transcendence. The famous 20th century modern architect Le Corbusier said very famously, a house should be a machine for living. It's one quote that many lay people have heard from a famous architect. But he didn't know how to actually make the machine work properly. For him, it was a kind of a metaphor for, for buildings expressing the, the zeitgeist of the machine age. And his, his beautiful houses looked very machine-like. But what he said is true, that a house should be a machine for living. But it can only be so if the machine can be designed according to laws of nature, because those are the only machines that work, right? I mean, any Stanford engineering student knows that. And this gives us the possibility of actually designing working house machines to have nourishing influences on us. So what is where um, makes a difference. Dining ideally south center, living room ideally west center, meditation ideally in the northeast, for example. Um, more of these are on our website, and uh, I'm not here to promote the website, but that's, that's where some follow-up is, and it's maharishivastu.org. The next way in which a building has an effect upon consciousness is through its proportions and its measurements. Now, this is not a surprising thing. In fact, the architects of many cultures throughout history have independently of each other analyzed the beautiful, perfect-seeming structures of nature, seashells, feathers, the human proportion, eggs. And they found certain measurements and proportions that recur again and again in these apparently perfect objects. And they concluded, in many cases, that there must be some underlying intelligence which is using proportion and measurement in some way to have some good effect. And there are many names for this. It's sacred geometry is one common reference for this perspective. And, and that is correct. That is correct. And, and it, is, it is also the case that, as many architecture students learn in school, many of the great buildings that we study, if you sort of analyze them, you can find these proportions applied because the architects just felt, well, these proportions used in nature structures must be of some value, so I'll try to incorporate them in my building. And that was a good attempt. And that is a major part of Vedic architecture, of Stapachaved. It's a huge subject. Learning the proportions is a, is a, is a, vast, a vast field. But in the end, it's, it's basically invisible. If you visit, and I'll show you some photos if you want to see a Vedic house, you're not going to notice the proportions or the measurements of it. But, and, if, and they're very flexible. You know, if a house wants to be about 30 by 40, then we find a number, uh, we find some proportions that are very close to that, it might be off by a few inches, maybe a foot from the desire. But when the proportions and measurements are set according to nature's patterns, then it is, as an analogy, which may have some actual truth to it, I don't know, it's like a stringed instrument, a violin, a piano, <clears throat> that's properly tuned, whereby you pluck one string and you get sympathetic overtones in the other strings. What we understand from the Vedic literature about proportion and measurement is that it maintains balance and harmony in the structures of nature. And we can promote balance and harmony in the structures that humans create through using the same, the same formulas. The next subject that we refer to is not so complex. It's very straightforward, very simple. How many of you have heard of the term sick building syndrome? Most of you. It refers to a phenomenon which has 
occurred only in recent decades as we have been able to, for the first time in human civilization, build buildings out of synthetic materials. This carpeting, for instance, you know, is not made of wool or paints are made of petrochemicals that are distilled. And many of these chemicals outgas volatile organic compounds, a little less so in California than other states because California regulates air quality. But then uh, buildings have, are very tight to be energy efficient. And that means that indoor air is not exchanged constantly with outdoor air. And the result is that, according to published statistics, the air quality in the average new house is six times more polluted than the average air quality outside of that house in the same neighborhood, which is a very bitter, unpleasant thing. So the solution is very straightforward. Just three words, two words and one phrase. Natural, non-toxic. And operating windows, I don't see any operating windows in this room, <laughs> to have cross ventilation. And of course, you know, seasonally we, we can't, or we're spoiled. We are used to such a narrow thermal and humidity comfort zone that we have to heat and cool and dehumidify our houses now much of the year. So if we do that, then at least we should have constant fresh air 24-7 going into the house. So that's, that's it for natural and non-toxic materials. And that's something that we're very vigilant on in creating environments, houses that support the pure flow of consciousness. Now the next is the site. For instance, based on everything that I've told you, do you think it would be a good thing or a bad thing to build a house on a site that has a hill to the east of it? This is a test of whether you've been paying attention. Good or bad? How many say good? Nobody. Good. One person. I won't say who it was. <laughs> Why? Because a hill will block that influence of the cosmic energy coming from the east. Not a good thing. So in the work that we do, and I had this consultation service, as Michael mentioned, for the past 17 years that provides this information to builders, architects, developers, and potential homeowners across North America. We've done uh, a third or a half a billion dollars worth of projects. We always hope that people come to us before they bought their lot. And then we do a site evaluation. And thanks to Google Earth, we don't have to go to the site in order to do the site evaluation. It's very handy. Topography is one of the main things that we look at, and there are several others, including where water is based. So with these different factors that I've talked about, does this really amount to hacking consciousness? Do these factors really alter how we perform inside of a building? The best study that's been done to date is another pilot study, and I am waiting, I am hoping that the researcher will follow it up with a full study that he is able to publish. He's He's a statistician and professor of business, and he's published a lot of studies. So I'm hoping he's going to do a larger survey. But this is, this is what he wanted to know. He asked the question, OK, this body of knowledge, I'm a business professor. How good are you at predicting how successful businesses will be? So an associate of mine, a woman who is also a Vedic architect, looked at aerial photographs of corporate headquarters. And he collected the financials, the annual statements from these corporations. Now, in order to get strong correlations, he randomly selected businesses from a database of very small companies. Why? Because he wanted to make sure that each company occupies only a single building. Why would that make a difference? Well, if the company has two buildings and one faces east and one faces west, what is the orientation influence going to be on the success of that company? It's muddled. It's not going to show up clearly. So, so he randomly selected 30 companies that each occupy only a single building and that are all publicly traded so that he could go through five years of, of um, financial statements. 
And according to him, there's, there's one statistic that you can extract from a financial statement, which is the best regarded measurement of how financially efficient a company is, and that's how much income they make per employee. It's a measure of the success of the human capital, of how effectively people are operating inside of that building through the lens of money, which is the lens of measurement of success of companies predominantly. So my associate uh, uh, looked at aerial photographs, and she was able to ascertain five predictors. Obviously, the direction the building faced. Second, the shape of the building. I haven't talked about that yet. Third, a pattern. And there are a bunch of patterns in Vedic buildings. One is that they, we always make sure that they have a fence or a wall around them with the gate to the east, possibly a secondary gate to the north. That reinforces that eastern orientation effect. Sounds like ooga booga or sounds like superstition, but I can tell you some stories that will make the hair stand up on the back of your head about the fences. So these, most of these businesses did have fences. So she had a third factor, and the fourth factor is the topography, where is the nearest hill? And the fifth is, where is the nearest water? Now, this researcher is Danish, and he did this research on businesses in the Faroe Islands, which are small volcanic islands in the North Atlantic. All settlement is around the perimeter of the, building, of the, the islands, and so every business had a strong water influence somewhere nearby, a large body of water, the North Atlantic, was somewhere quite close to the building. And they all had a, a mountain or a large hill somewhere quite close. So those two factors were really measurable. So she had five factors, and then she scored each of the 30 buildings. And in the meantime, he did the statistical analysis of them. And then they compared their lists. And she had accurately predicted the degree of financial success of 27 out of the 30 companies. So this seems to be a very high correlation. Now, 30 is not a hugely statistically significant population. And as I said, I am waiting for a follow-up with 100 companies. But it's still, it's, it's, very, it's very tantalizing. It suggests that when you combine multiple factors from this ancient body of knowledge in analyzing the influence of buildings on us, multiple factors correlate with higher and higher degrees of influence on us as predicted. Remember when we were only looking at one thing at, at um, building orientation, what was popping out from that was the bad one, that the worst direction seemed to every time associate with the worst quality of life. But it didn't further finally discriminate between the other three. But when we have five factors, then it seems to be really very statistically I shouldn't use that phrase. It seems to be a, to produce very strong correlations with each of the four directions, et cetera. So it seems to be a very useful technology, well worthy of considering. And now I think you have an understanding of why an architect was act, asked to speak in this course because it is actually my assertion that buildings have very dramatic effects upon consciousness. They have very dramatic effects upon our success, our happiness, our health, our personal relationships, and our growth to enlightenment. That's what the texts say. And anecdotally, I can assure you, we've on the hundreds and hundreds of houses we've done, and we've done many post-occupancy studies that and I, of course, have been living and working in these buildings for many years, as you should expect me to do, that this is people's experiences. So let's have a look. OK, do you want to have a look? All right. We'll take a quick tour around the world. This is a complex of buildings that we built in Japan. And it's a very traditional Japanese structure. It is. It's post and beam. It's actually the largest, as is traditional in Japan, it's actually the largest post and beam structure in Japan. And you recognize Japanese details in it. But it's built 
obviously east facing proportions, materials, placement of different functions, evaluation of the site are all according to this body of knowledge. This is a project actually that I'm working on right now with uh, clients in Japan, in China rather. Um, and uh, I'm doing a couple of projects in China and uh, one project in which we're building a building in China and bringing it to the US and we're modifying traditional Chinese architecture to incorporate these principles and it's a fine fit and on these projects, um, the projects have feng shui consultants who are blessing what I'm doing. So there seems to be some, some good fit in, in those cases. In India, um, this is of course the original home of this organization that Maharishi founded and, and uh, one of the things that, that he had uh, done there was uh, founding many schools. Actually, it's the largest private school system in all of India. Um, and these are just a few snapshots of, of some fairly crude but large uh, Vastu uh, schools um, all across India. Here's a house in Australia that was just finished about a year and a half ago. Now, here's something dramatically different from this. Here's a house in Spain that was built 15 years ago. It's very, very according to the traditional architecture of Spain. It's stone walls and clay barrel tile roofs as we know so well in, at Stanford, I believe. Um, but it is, it is exactly a a Vastu home according to Maharshi's revival of that knowledge. Here's a chalet in Switzerland, but it's a very modernist chalet. It's also a good passive solar design. The um, side to the left is the south side and it has lots of glass, but that glass is all shaded so that the summer sun doesn't enter through the south, but the win winter sun does. By the way, we understand that light from all directions is nourishing and we favor windows on all sides, but there is a certain special quality to east light as I've described. Here's a house in Brazil. I just have a couple of details because as is common in, in this location, there's a, a wall very tight around the house and it's not possible to get a, get a good view of the house. Here's a school that we're building in Kenya. Um, it's not complete yet in this photograph, but the kids are already using it. Um, and it will be plastered uh, when it's complete. And I'm, I'm just now starting work on a school in Tanzania myself. I did not design this. Um, we, uh, as a part of this revival of Vedic knowledge that Maharshi has spearheaded, we create schools around the world uh, with consciousness-based education, uh, usually for orphans and, or poor kids who can't otherwise be in school. And, so this is one, and the one I'm about to work on will be another. Now to the United States. Here we are in uh, Wyoming, um, in the mountains. And uh, it's, a, it's a kind of basically a log cabin. Technically, it's post and beam. Um, it's in Jackson Hole. And here's an interior of that house. Here's a house on the East Coast for a couple who kind of love Japanese architecture. But they're both also very creative. They're both artisans themselves. And on the inside, they went kind of wild um, doing everything they wanted to do. Here's a very sedate house also on the East Coast, very traditional kind of Scottish medieval revival house. Here's a fairly conventional house in Cincinnati. That water is to the north, by the way, which is a good direction for water to be, and that's why they picked this lot. One thing which is a little bit unusual about this house, which is commonly done in Vastu houses, weather permitting, is that it's, the house wraps around a courtyard. And here is a view of that. I live in Iowa in a small town where a quarter of the population meditate. Uh, many of us meditate in uh, two domes uh, twice a day, hundreds of us. And um, it's, a, it's an intentional community, a very large one. I actually live in Maharishi Vedic City, 
a town that we founded, and by law of the city council, every building built in that town uses this technology. Every one is a Vastu building. So here's one of the homes there, and here is an interior of it. Closer to your home, if you live here, is the home that I spent last night in, uh, in Coralitos. Coralitos, just completed a few months ago. Um, and uh, the request for this house was that it be in the Santa Barbara mission style. Here's a house on the East Coast. It's, uh, it's a vacation house for family that, that through uh, a combined uh, two former marriages have six kids. So they wanted a large loft uh, and everybody sleeps on the floor in the loft when, when everybody's there. Here's a view down from the loft. Here's a house in the Colorado Rockies. And next is uh, the very first house that was built as these principles were just starting to come out. We didn't get all of them into this house, just a few of them. And then we went back later as more information came out and did some remodeling. This was, uh, as, as uh, Michael mentioned, the, f the first half of my career was largely devoted to the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. And this couple found me because they had seen a, a drawing of a house and they loved it and they wanted a house similar to it. And after some research, they figured out that it was a particular house by Frank Lloyd Wright that they had loved. And so I knew the owner and arranged for them to go to Chicago with me and have a look at the house. And then we designed a house for them using these principles that also is very much influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. And here's one interior of it with Wright reproduction furniture. And here's the living room. Now, uh, in Florida, we have a community of about six homes. And I wanted, the last thing that I'm going to talk to you about is what happens when you don't have just one. What is the effect on consciousness? What is the effect on our functioning in, in the world if we are in an environment where there are a number of these homes built? Because it, it's the literature suggests that there are very specific good effects. And uh, so I'm going to spend my last few minutes uh, a little bit of time talking about that. But first, I'm just mentioning that this, though it's a rendering, is of a house that has since been built uh, in a community in Florida um, where there are six Vastu homes in close proximity. This is a rendering uh, done by one of my European associates for a European home, a very classical Palladian revival style. Here's a house that I built in um, uh, Lincoln, Massachusetts. It's a rendering because the trees are so thick there. I haven't been able to get a good photograph of it. Um, but it's in a historic district uh, on Paul Revere's ride. It's overlooking Paul Revere National Park. And I was instructed that I would have to design something in the federal, compatible with the federal style. And so that's what I did in this case. And um, this is a house that just came to me deep in meditation uh, one day. And then I went to dinner and I sketched this out on a napkin. And um, it's since been built. Uh, but the view from the street, you can't see that it has a courtyard. So um, I like to show this rendering of it. This is another rendering. But it's, it's just your classic bungalow, which there are so many of in the Bay Area. Um, but it is, it is a Maharshi Vastu house. And, placement of the rooms, the proportion, the orientation, the materials are all according to this knowledge and the site, of course. And I, I didn't design it, but I, I, I got to house it in it for a week. And it was a very wonderful experience. I, I haven't really talked about the experience of living in these, of, of applying this knowledge and what the effect of it is on us, I, except that it is true. It seems to be very accurate that, as the ancient texts predict, that good health is improved. Uh, I can tell you cases of chronic diseases that actually abated when people moved into Vastu houses or even just closed up an inauspicious door and just started using the auspicious back door. I mean, it's powerful stuff. And uh, happiness, uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a universal of people who live in these homes that they are, they are profoundly happier. They speak of the quality of bliss, which is that kind of beyond happiness that's associated with, with pure consciousness. Um, and Success, prosperity. We've had a few cases 
two cases of businesses that have moved in and out and in and out of Vastu office buildings because we've built about 15 now. And, um, and, we've, and they've actually seen their success go up and down as they were in and out of the Vastu building. So, you know, it really looks like that that prediction is, is being borne out. Um, and enlightenment, uh, growth to enlightenment. Uh, this is, is again, the, the common experience of people who live in these homes. And I, if that's interesting enough to you, I could spend a few minutes on it. But I think I'll just wait until the end. And if anybody wants to ask a question about that, I'll be happy to answer. This is a house that's under construction right now, so it's obviously a rendering. But it's a house that I designed in Kauai. Um, that's why it looks like it's in Hawaii. Um, and the wife is of Japanese ancestry. And so at her request, it's a very Japanese-influenced home. Um, I'll quickly show you a, a, a few larger buildings, some others. This is a nine-story commercial office building in suburban Washington, DC. By the way, one thing that the average person in America thinks of when they think of the concept of buildings in accord with natural law is they think, well, they must be energy efficient. They're environmentally efficient. They're sustainable. And this is a, a concern, which of course has only risen within our generation within the last three decades or so, as we, for the first time, become focused on, on natural resources and um, air quality, carbon footprint of buildings. And um, that is certainly an important consideration in designing a natural law-based building, that it be environmentally um, sustainable, that it, it have a small carbon footprint. And so we have simply adopted the values of sustainability as a principle of Vedic architecture. It is so obviously a principle of nature's own architecture. And so I was mentioning that right now because the, the predominant standard for measuring the degree of sustainability of a building in the United States is promulgated by something called LEED. And the highest of their standards is platinum. And this building earned that standard. Here's a detail of one of the corners. And uh, the lobby. Should be some people. But when architectural photographers take pictures of the interior of buildings, they always scoot the people out. All the desks are oriented to the east and to the north. And all the desks in this building get plenty of sunlight. There's no bullpen at the interior of the building with no windows. This is the bullpen. Closer to you in Bakersfield is this blood and cancer center where people go to be treated for cancer. This is one of our first projects. I was the consultant on it. I, I was not the architect. But it dates back uh, 16 years. But it's the, the founder of it has been very struck by the effect upon moving into this building. And it's been very good for business. And, and we're working now on the third addition to the building. And I talked to him first about six months after they had first moved into the building. And he said, well, you know, I think our outcomes are improving. But I don't, I don't have a double blind uh, set of data to, to validate that. So I'm not claiming it. But that does seem to be the case. And certainly our. Um, Employee satisfaction is, is way up. People, our employees are happier working this building. But the thing that was most noteworthy to him was that, as we all know, when you're treated for cancer, you're being poisoned. Radiation and chemotherapy are both killing cells in the body. And they are poisoning, hopefully, the bad cells more than the good cells. But a result of being poisoned that many people experience if they get chemo is that they get nauseous after the treatments. Um, and so people normally are, after several treatments for cancer, don't want to go back to the building. Their body doesn't want to go to the place that made them nauseous. And what he found is that his patients who were in between treatments were coming to the building for visits. And so that, to him, was the most telling effect. Now, I'm going a little over, so I'm going to skip the physics lesson. But I'm simply going to say to you, I'm going to assert to you that there are many systems in, 
in the physical uh, universe where if the particles that compose the structure can become coherent, can be aligned with each other, then that structure becomes kind of invincible. It repels negative outside incoherent influences. And Maharshi told us that the same thing would be true if we could build a Vastu city. And we built a number of communities. And um, this is one uh, that I live very near, which is completely off the grid, because he, from the first, promoted getting energy directly from the sun. And this is, this is one community we built, which is completely off the grid. This is a community in England, 26 homes and a community center, and a couple of photos of, the, of them. And um, they're very traditional English homes, according to that part of England. What time? We have had quite a few, at this point, five incidents where there's been some natural disaster in the proximity of groups of Vastu buildings. And in each time, that disaster such as this forest fire in eastern San Diego County that some of you remember, um, bypass the Vastu buildings. They stop right at the fences, don't damage the fence, don't damage the building. And so it seems, and this is obviously not science, and we have no explanation through a uh, scientific paradigm yet, and we have no double-blind study, but it seems that even our interaction with the natural world seems to be affected by building buildings which are coherent, which are structures according to natural law. We are structures according to natural law. Our solar system is. The cells in our body are. The galaxy is. And when we can inhabit the immediate environment that we do inhabit, which is our homes and our cities, that are also structures according to natural law, then it is as though we have been listening to a radio in the proximity of something that's causing static. And for the first time, the cause of the static is removed, as though we tune that radio more precisely. And suddenly, the signal is coming through clearly. It is a coherent signal. The effect is very powerful. And if you take one thing from this lecture in Hacking Consciousness, it's Pay attention to the buildings that you live in because they have a real effect upon you. So thank you very much. Any comments or questions? <laughs> Which one of you wants to go first? What is the effect of Wi-Fi? Well, you're not asking me what the effect is, but you're concerned about the effect, and you want to know what our relationship with that is. It gets harder and harder with each passing year, but we strongly promote um, no use of Wi-Fi in these homes. We always have every room wired for Ethernet. Um, and obviously, your iPad can't, you know, it only communicates via Wi-Fi or, or cell phone communication. And so we discourage them being used. Um, and um, we also follow all the good protocols to avoid electromagnetic radiation pollution in houses. We use shielded cable. We have kill switches that ensure that at bedtime you can kill all the electrical current surrounding the bedroom. Um, we do all of those protocols um, to, to try to minimize. But those which are broadcast from outside of the house, we don't have control over. And I think this is what you're asking me. We do not, we do not have any reason to think. We don't, certainly don't have any data uh, to suggest that the effects of EMF are reduced by virtue of being in a Vastu home. I'd like to think they are, but we have no evidence of that. The question, the, the question which I'll repeat, um, was we, I spent quite a bit of time talking about why we should sleep in certain directions and not in others. And your question then was about waking activity, creative work, uh, or uh, other kinds of work, uh, what direction should we face? Yeah. Well, I'm not a physiologist and I'm not a physician, but so I'm giving you a completely, in part, a lay person's answer. My impression, being no more founded than any of yours, is that we would never seek out a situation that would subject our physiology to stress, that would make the organs work harder. 
for that goal. Certainly, we, we do athletics, which make our heart pump harder, for instance, and that has benefits to us. But um, no, I, would, I maintain that for brain coherence, for activities that we really want uh, to perform at a high level, unless we're sleeping while we're doing them, we should see whether there's a possibility to face east or to face north. There isn't, um, from our perspective, any reason to seek out an orientation that would cause the organs of the body to work harder. No. Yes. So I was curious about the feng shui idea. You said that it's very auspicious for the direction south in feng shui, and it is not so, of course, um, the mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. So what was you know, the conversation that you had with those people on mm -hmm. why? What are the reasons? Mm -hmm. Well, I am not an authority on feng shui, um, and I have a, a quite a bit of regard for it. Uh, all I can do is share with you um, two or three things that I've learned. One is that there are different schools of feng shui, and the predominant school in the United States is one that, according to its founder, has been quite a bit of it has been created within the last decades. And so it's, it's substantially different from some of the ancient schools that exist in uh, China, for instance. And as I said, a couple of projects that I worked on in China, uh, the feng shui masters of my clients, whom I never met, um, examined my designs and didn't make any changes to them. So there, so there seem to be some schools in China that um, are quite harmonious. I asked one feng shui master, is there any, any actual historical relationship between the two disciplines? And he said, oh, yes, our discipline records that feng shui comes from Vastu. And maybe it came over to China at the same time that Buddhism did and Chinese or uh, Indian brush painting. I don't know. I'm, I, I cannot claim that. Uh, I'm simply passing on something that a feng shui master said. Now, in my last conversation with a feng shui master, which was only um, about three weeks ago, um, we, we, had, we spent quite a bit of time together. And it was, it was really delightful. And, uh, and I, we were sort of talking about this. And he said, well, yes, we know that there is a special quality to the influence of the energy coming from the east, from the sun at the time of sunrise, that that's the most nourishing thing. And we figure that if the sun is good, and you're in the northern hemisphere, and the sun spends most of its time in the southern part of the sky, that it's probably best then to have lots of openings to the south. Um, and so you know that's just a conclusion. And it's not our conclusion. And that may be you know, the explanation. I, I would love to learn more, uh, but I think that that the real answers are, are, are lost in the, the mists of history and will probably never be known. Yes. Um, two questions or three questions. Number one, what time do you meditate at, at um, Fairfield? In the morning, what time do they suggest? Um, we, I have to actually do a calculation to tell you. <laughs> uh, so give me just a second. Um, Seven thirty-five. Okay, so that's after sunrise, and I'm just thinking about meditation and yes. the rays of the sun, right? Yes. And you face the east, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Number two, if you want to put a water fountain or a waterfall or whatever on your property, yes. Which place on the property would you put it? Would you put it in the north corner? The, well, a, a, a single ideal place is in the northeast. Mm -hmm. Is in the northeast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's more. There's more to it, but that's that's a good take home. Yeah. If, if you were going to build a home along the ocean or a lake, then which? Mm -hmm. How would you orient that? Well, I wouldn't build a home close, very close to the Pacific Ocean when the Pacific Ocean is is to the west, because of a negative influence from that. If we get far enough away, then it's fine. Um, uh, we uh, water to the east, water to the north is nourishing. So I'll, I'll recount the question very briefly for those who couldn't hear. Uh, there were two, two parts. The second part was why does where you have different activities in a house 
have effects. So I claim that. Why, why, what could be the explanation? And the second, the first question was really, what are the, sci what are the, the explanations within science for why these things happen? I'm so glad somebody asked that. And we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because this has just been coming out in the West in recent years. And you know the way science works. The step number one in science is observation of natural phenomena, collecting data on them to rigorously to determine whether there is some thing happening. And at that point, it becomes the purview of science, the goal of science, to consider why that thing may be happening and to propose some hypotheses. And then based on the hypothesis, you can test the hypothesis. And that process, which is the process of science, takes a long time. And it requires the world of science to see that there is some naturalistic observation that is significant and then start, start studying it. And that's just starting now. John Hagelin, who spoke earlier in the course, so you, you missed him, is a quantum physicist. And he's been probing this. And he's actually got a hypothesis that is based on quantum physics for what is the value in an Eastern orientation. But at this point, it's just his hypothesis. It hasn't been subjected to any study yet. I mean, this is the cool thing about the Vedic knowledge. It's been preserved for thousands of years. It was arrived at not through science, but arrived at subjectively. That is, people deep in meditation, people highly evolved at deep points in that some of them have direct cognitions of natural law. And they come out, and they're able to record that. And if we regard that tradition, we may regard their assertions about the nature of the vibrations of intelligence. But it's completely subjective. Now, that sounds, on the face of it, completely inimical to Western science until we read the memoirs of our greatest scientists. Albert Einstein, for instance, described that when he had his insight into what became known as general relativity, that it was, and I'm paraphrasing, but it was basically a cognition that he had. He just knew inside nature must work like this. And he declared it. And then after he published it, the next time there was a solar eclipse, researchers trained their telescopes on the, on, the, on the sun at the time of the eclipse. And they were able to determine that, in fact, the rays of the sun were bent by the proximity of the moon between us and the sun. And they accepted that as a validation of general relativity. And they rushed to Albert Einstein. And they declared to him, you were right. We have proved it. And his response paraphrasing again was, I'm not interested in your verification. I don't need to hear about your observation. I saw this inside. I know that it is true. And in fact, many of the great advances in Western science were arrived at through the direct cognition of natural law. But then science exists to test them, to validate them, and then to figure out how to use them. And so. We are at a junction point in world history where in this generation, and maybe some of you in your own careers as biologists, those of you who are, have an opportunity to bring the objective methodology of science to bear on these subjective traditions. And I hope that many of you do that in your careers. It will be a good thing for the world. This is probably a good question to end on, so thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.